Hey, welcome to another episode of the Bible in Life podcast. I'm so glad that you're joining me on the show. On this show, we try to give what I like to call blue jeans theology. That is theology for everyday life. Because I believe the Word of God is the central thing to helping us live the kind of life we were created to live. In fact, Psalm chapter 1, really the heart of this ministry and the heart of this show, says that when our life is rooted deeply in the Word of God, that we can have a thriving, flourishing life. And that's the heart behind the Bible and Life podcast and really the Bible and Life ministry in general. So I am so glad you're here checking out the show. If this is your first time uh, on the podcast, welcome. I am really glad you're here. If you're a regular listener, thanks for being a part of the Bible and Life family. Big news is this, that uh, we just crossed 20,000 downloads on the podcast. That's right, 20,000 downloads. This podcast has been around about a year and a half. And so in a year and a half, 20,000 uh, downloads of the show. That's super awesome. So thank you for listening. Thanks for participating. Thanks for sharing and posting and all that other stuff. So I would just encourage you to keep doing the same. If you got friends who are podcast listeners and are looking for some good Bible teaching podcast, share this with them. If you uh, are active on social media, post the Bible and Life podcast and recommend it to your friends. Go on to iTunes and rate and review the show. That helps us get more traffic through iTunes. And so thank you for being a part of helping this podcast just continue to grow and making a difference in people's lives. I'm so grateful to each and every one of you and grateful to God that uh, this, this podcast just has reached that 20,000 download mark. So thanks a ton. Thanks for being a part of the show. All right, here's what we have been up to of late on the Bible and Life podcast. We have specifically been uh, really wanting to let Jesus teach us how to pray, and we have been doing that primarily through the Lord's Prayer. We had an introductory episode where we looked at Jesus's life of prayer and how really prayer was just part and parcel of the way Jesus organized his life, arranged his life, conducted his life, that he was a man of prayer. And to be a disciple means you imitate your master. Since Jesus is our master, we imitate him. He made time for prayer. He arranged his life to pray. Pray. So we do the same as his disciples. We follow him. And then it also means to listen to his teaching on prayer. And the, the Lord's Prayer really, at least in Luke's account, grew out of the disciples asking Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. And so we have been letting Jesus do that and using the Lord's Prayer to be our guide in that, specifically Matthew's version, because it's a little more familiar version of that. And so on last week's episode, we said we need to make sure we understand who we're praying to, that we're not just praying to some big, powerful, majestic God out there. We're praying to our Father in heaven. And what does that mean? And we looked at how Jesus fleshes that out with the the picture of God as Father in the prodigal son story. So if you haven't listened to last week's episode, you might want to check that one out as well. So you have really this deep, intimate, respectful, beautiful picture of God as Father that Jesus gives to us, and that's who we pray to. Today we want to take the next line in the Lord's Prayer and continue to let Jesus teach us really about our posture and our heart set and our deepest concerns as people of prayer. And the next line in the Lord's Prayer after our Father in heaven, the next line is, hallowed be your name. And we want to take that up here in just a second. But before we jump specifically to that line, here's what I want us to notice about the, the Lord's Prayer in general. After giving us this introduction, this address, our Father in heaven, what Jesus does is the prayer lists off six requests. The first one is that, uh, hallowed be your name, that request for God's name to be hallowed. Then uh, your kingdom come. Then the third one, your will be done. Number four is give us our daily bread. Number five is um, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And then number six is deliver us from evil. And those are the six requests in the Lord's Prayer. Notice the first three, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Those three are you requests, meaning they focus on God. They're, 
They're, God, would this be true about you? Would you do this for your name's sake? They're you requests focusing on really God's purposes, God's plans, God's great majestic story. And they invite us into that story of God. They remind us of his purposes. They remind us of when we come to God and we follow him, what we're involved in. So, God, would you carry out your purposes and would your will be done? And then the third or the next three requests are a me request, we request. They focus on us and our needs. Uh, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And deliver us from evil. They're we request. And they focus on our needs as people. And they invite God into our problems, our struggles, our life, our situation. And they ask for God's help in that. And that's really the way the, the uh, Lord's Prayer is structured. And so as Jesus teaches us to pray, the first thing he does is he helps us set our gaze on God and God's purposes and God's name and God's greatness and God's really big story, and they invite us into that. All right, now, let's jump into the very first of those six requests. Hallowed be your name. That's where we want to start, and that's what we want to look at here. So, hallowed be your name. What does that mean, hallowed be your name? Well, the first thing to notice out of that is that God has a name. That may seem kind of obvious, right? That may seem self-explanatory to us. That may seem even familiar to us that God has a name. But don't, don't um, really don't let the familiarity of that kind of cause you to say, oh, yeah, yeah God has a name. That, that reminds us that God is personal. He's a person. He can be known. He's a person with a very specific name. In fact, in Exodus chapter 3, God introduces himself to Moses and gives his name. His name is Yahweh. The one who is is the idea. That word Yahweh in Hebrew in Exodus 3 comes from the uh, Hebrew verb Yihya, which means uh, I am. I'm the living one. So God just is. He's the one who cannot not be. He just exists in, um, because it's impossible for him not to exist. That's who God is. He's the living one. And he is Yahweh. I am. And so God has a name and he's a person and he can be known because of that. That's really, really important for us. He's not just some sort of power, right? Some sort of energy force. He's a person. So God has a name and he's, his name embodies his character. It embodies who he is. That's the way the name worked in Jewish thought world and in the ancient Near East. And the name is not just, oh, John, Sam, Mary, Bob. The name is really the expression of the person. And so for God to have his name, when it's hallowed be your name, that name embodies his whole character, his whole person, and who he is. All right. And so God has a name and that name needs to be hallowed. Well, what does that mean, right? Like hallowed. What? We, we just don't use that word. The closest we might get is in a Harry Potter book or a Harry Potter movie, The Deathly Hallows. But what does that even mean, right? And here, what does hallowed mean in this case? What does this word hallowed mean? Well, the word hallowed um, comes from the Greek word that it's related to the, the word for holy. Um, it's the really the, the particular form of the verb to make holy. Um, and so to say, hallowed be your name, is may your name be holy. Uh, make your name holy. That's what we're asking when we say, hallowed be your name. We're asking God, God, would you make your name holy among us and through us and in this world? But that seems a little odd, doesn't it? Like, because God's name already is holy, isn't it? Think of, for example, Isaiah chapter 6 and the great vision of God that the prophet Isaiah has in Isaiah 6 where he's caught up in this vision. He sees the temple. He sees God filling the temple. The train of his robe, right, fills the whole temple. And then the angels are gathered around God. And what are they saying in this vision that Isaiah has in Isaiah 6? Well, they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. So God is holy. In fact, there in Isaiah 6, holy is repeated three times, which, by the way, that's important. That's a way of making It's like holiness to the third power, holiness cubed. That's what, what we're getting at by that. And interestingly enough, not to minimize the love of God, God's love is 
uh, amazing, beyond our comprehension, right? We don't, Paul says we can never know the height, the depth, the width of God's love. So God's love is amazing. But notice they're not saying, the angels aren't saying, love, love, love. They're saying, holy, holy, holy. And that gets repeated in Revelation as well. Holy, holy, holy. So holiness is at the essence of God's character. Holiness is at the core of God's personhood. And so God is holy. He is he is separate from his creation. He's other than his creation. He's not identified with his creation. He's beyond it, greater than it, something uh, just completely different from his creation. He is holy, both in personhood and in character. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So God is already holy. Not only that, when you read through the Psalms, you see this over and over and over again about God's name being holy. So for example, Psalm 31, 21 says, for our heart rejoices in, in him because we trust in his holy name. Or Psalm 97, 12 says, be glad in the Lord, you righteous ones. Give thanks to his holy name. Or Psalm 103, verse one, bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. That God's name is holy. So why would Jesus teach us when he's teaching us to pray, why would he teach us to ask for God to make his name holy if his name already is holy? If holiness is just who he is, why would Jesus say, you need to pray this way, God, make your name holy. And that's what hallowed be your name means. Well, the reason for that is because we also know from the scriptural text, the scriptural story, that God's name can be treated as unholy. It can be profaned. To profane something is to treat it as unholy, as base, as common. So when we say God's name is holy, yes, but God's name can also be treated as unholy. For example, the well-known um, command in the Ten Commandments, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You shall not profane his name. You shall not treat it as empty, as common, as vain, right? Like that would be profaning his name and treating it as unholy. Or a really, really important text on this idea of making your name holy, O God, is Ezekiel chapter 36. Uh, Ezekiel is written in the story of the Bible, is written after Israel has gone into captivity. So they've been sent away into captivity because of their disloyalty to God, because of their disloyalty to Yahweh. And as a result of that, they have, they have made God's name profane among the nations, right? They have debased the name of God. And so Ezekiel 36, verse 20 says this, When they, Israel, when Israel came to the nations where they went, where they were sent away into captivity, so when they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name, God says. They, notice that. Because it was said of them, here's how the nations responded, These are the people of the Lord, yet they have come out of his land. So they have been captive, taken captive out of God's very own land, God's very own place, God's very own temple. And so they have made God's name low and debased and profaned among the nations. So how does God respond to that? Well, look at Ezekiel 36 verse 21. It says this, but God says, I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations where they went. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It's not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. Notice that. God is about to act uh, on Israel's behalf. He's about to do something. In other words, what he's alluding to is he's going to rescue his people from captivity. He's going to bring them back to their land. He's going to regather them and reestablish them, and there'll be a new temple, and God's going to act and bring deliverance for his people, and he's doing it for the sake of his holy name. Let's keep reading. Verse 23, God says, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. 
Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. And so notice that God is going to act for his name. He's going to vindicate the holiness of his name. He's going to make his name great among them by showing the holiness of his name. Well, that's, that's really at the heart, I think, of what Jesus is getting at when he says, pray this prayer. Pray, oh God, may your name be holy and treated as holy. And so there's really two parts to that that we see here in Exodus or in Ezekiel 36. One is we see that this, this concern of God for the glory and the greatness and the holiness of his name because it has been treated as common. And so God's people have a responsibility to uphold, if you will, to, uh, to lift up the holiness of God's great name, to treat it with the honor and the respect that it deserves. And the, reason, the way it was dishonored by Israel was they broke the covenant. They were disloyal to God. And as a result, God had to um, carry out the curses of the old covenant and send them away into exile. And so now the, the nations look down on God. They look down on God's glory, down on God's greatness. They profane his name. Its name is treated as common. Eh, who is Yahweh, right? And so that's the idea of, oh, well, we need to make his name holy. We need to uphold the holiness of God's name before the people. The other, the other real important thing to notice out of this is that there's this great sense, I think, of respect, of reverence of care for. If you are God's holy people, then you want God's name to be cared for. You want God to make his name great. And he's going to do that, he says in Ezekiel, when he acts to deliver his people. And so when we pray, God, hallowed be your name, make your name great. It's connected to his promises. It's connected to his redemption. It's connected to God acting to make his name great among the nations. And so as we pray, that's our great concern. We want God to make his name great. We want God to uh, show the glory and the greatness of his name by acting to bring salvation. And when we're talking about Jesus originally, in the original context, teaching his disciples to pray, they're still really waiting for that. Like, they, yes, they have been regathered from the nations. Yes, they have returned to their land, but God's glory hasn't filled the temple yet. And God hasn't brought his Messiah yet. And there hasn't been ultimate and final deliverance yet. They're still under foreign occupation and foreign oppression. And they're, they're, they're waiting for God to act and really inaugurate and bring into play the, the final stage of God's plan in history. And so Jesus, as the bringer of God's kingdom, he is telling his disciples, really, and, and us, Pray for God to act and for God to fulfill his promises and for God to show his glory and to do all the things that in his holiness and his greatness he has done so that his great name would be honored among the nations and would be vindicated. And that's ultimately what Jesus came to effect. And that's ultimately what we're about as his people. So listen, just to some Psalms that speak of this sort of thing, this really the heart of this prayer. Psalm 99 verses 1 through 3 says, the Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble, meaning the peoples of the earth. He is enthroned above the cherubim. Let the earth shake. This is, this is looking forward to the great day when God comes as king and when his kingdom is established on earth. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted above all the people. So his kingdom is over all the earth. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Psalm 99, 1 through 3. And so when God comes as king, all the peoples will see it and his great name will be exalted. Or Psalm 111, verse 9, speaking about how God's acting to carry out his promises and his purposes of redemption. Psalm 111, 9 says this, He has sent redemption to his people. He has ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Or once again, Psalm 24, verse 11 says, Lord, for the sake of your great name, forgive my guilt, for it is great. And so even 
asking for forgiveness grows out of a concern for God's name being treated with the honor and the respect it deserves. And, and so what we, what we really learn when Jesus says, pray this way, hallowed be your name, that if who we're praying to is God as Father, well, our great concern is that our Father's name be exalted, that it be treated with honor and respect, that the glory of God's great name would be seen among the nations. And so at the heart, really, of our praying is this concern for God's great name, for the holiness of God's name. And so we're really inviting God to act, to do um, what only he can do to display his greatness, to display his majesty. And our heart is caught up in that. And we want to, we want to see God's name be treated with the honor and the glory and the majesty and the respect that his holy and wonderful name deserves. And so as people who are learning to pray, what we learn is that our first concern, our first concern is that we as God's people live in such a way that it displays his, the holiness of his name. Our first concern is for God to work in this world in and through his people on and behalf his, of his promises and his purposes so that his name be magnified and treated with honor. And so as we learn to live a life of prayer, we become concerned with the things of God. We become concerned with the name of God being magnified. Um, and as we noted, the, this prayer goes on to even talk about our needs. But just know that Jesus starts with concern for God and God's things. And so our needs are really even set in this this majestic vision of the glory of God, this big vision of God. And so our needs are important and God cares about our needs, but our needs are set against the backdrop of the great and awesome and majestic holy name of God. And so um, as we grow as in, in prayer and learn to pray, Jesus wants us to pray, God, make your name great in this world. Holy be your name. May your name be treated with the utmost honor and respect and not profaned among the nations. God, act to bring about the glory and the greatness of your name. And we are people who are concerned about that. We're caught up in this great story of God and we want everyone to see his majesty and his greatness. That's our first concern as people of prayer is that God's name would be treated with the utmost honor and respect. Hey, thanks for joining me on the Bible and Life podcast. I'm so glad you're here. As always, this is a listener-supported show, and I couldn't do this online ministry without you and your support. So thank you to all of you who have signed up to be patrons on my Patreon page. Uh, you are a massive encouragement to me. We're currently going through a series over there on the Book of Romans and just kind of giving a bird's eye view of the book of Romans. And so if you want to sign up to be a patron, you can swing on over to my Patreon page. I'll have a link down in the notes below and you can uh, sign up to be a patron. You could get some bonus podcasts and other bonus resources, some discounts to my online courses and some of that. Um, and to those of you who give faithfully through World Family Mission, thank you for your support that way. All donations there are tax deductible. So thanks for supporting this ministry and supporting the work of God. May we together pray and work for the glory of God's great name. God bless you guys, and I look forward to talking again soon.